Hello, this is Brother Denny. Welcome to Charity Ministries. Our desire is that your life would be blessed and changed by this message. This message is not copyrighted and is not to be bought or sold. You are welcome to make copies for your friends and neighbors. If you would like additional messages, please go to our website for a complete listing at www.charityministries.org. If you would like a catalog of other sermons, please call 1-800-227-7902 or write to Charity Ministries, 400 West Main Street, Suite 1, Ephra, PA, 17522. These messages are offered to all without charge by the free will offerings of God's people. A special thank you to all who support this ministry. Amen. I also rejoice in the reports that we are able to hear and the opportunities that God gives us. And also, you know, as I was listening, I was just thinking again, and I think the thought many, many times, that we get involved. You know, it's not just one person going away and coming back and sharing, but we get involved. We go. We have the opportunities to go. And we take time out of life and go here or go there with a group, with a team, work together and see what God does, rejoice together over the things that God does while we're there. It's such a joy. What a way to train and prepare for future ministry. Get busy. Getting yourself involved now. It's beautiful. And I praise God for it. I also rejoice just to be home. We've been away for three weekends, so you don't know what it's like to be away for three weekends and be back home here. To be in a prayer meeting where brothers and sisters pour their hearts out before the Lord. To be in a song service where we don't sing, but we worship. Praise the Lord for this place that God has given to us. It is a gift, by the way, that you get to be in a church. I hope we'll all be responsible for what He's given to us. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer before we get into the message this morning. Father in heaven, we come to you again in Jesus' name. We come to you for bread. We need bread this morning, Lord. Lord, I think of some of the prayers that I heard pouring out of the heart of brothers in the prayer meeting this morning. Would you answer those prayers, God, today? We need direction for our lives. We want to hear what you are saying to the church. We acknowledge, Lord, that we lose our way quickly and we need your direction. And I pray, God, this morning that you will give direction to us as a church. Father, I pray that you'll help me this morning to be true to the things that you've laid upon my heart. Take away the fear that is in my heart, Lord. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. God, I trust this message to you, God, that you'll help me to give it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a more difficult sermon to give this morning. (coughs) 
You know, I don't believe a congregation can go forward in soundness, in stability, without a proper balance of food. Sometimes we need to be inspired, stirred, like our brother Kenny has inspired us this morning. Sometimes we need to be challenged to go on to greater heights. Sometimes we just need good, practical teaching. Sometimes we need to have our toes stepped on when we come to church. We need all of those. Otherwise, it won't come out right in the end. So this morning I have a bit more of a difficult message to give and, you know, in the natural, I'd just soon bow out of this message. But um, we don't get to do what we want to do, do we, brothers and sisters? Not if we're truly a disciple of the Lord. We don't get to do what we want to do. So... I have a bit of a hard message to give this morning because it will be very personal and practical that makes it a bit more difficult. The title of my message this morning is this, and I have a title and a subtitle if I can do that, The Generation Gap. The generation gap or generational drift in the church. I thought about the title, the generation gap. You know, it's a bit of a modern term. I checked in the old Webster's 1828 dictionary to see if I could find it in there. It's not in there. Not that they didn't have the problem. I know they had the problem. You'll find it all the way back into the way back in the Old Testament. But the term is a bit of a new one. The generation gap. Generational drift in the church. That is the drifting of the next generation away from the principles and the practices of their fathers and mothers. Maybe that would be the third subtitle, but that's too long for a title, amen? Secular society's view of this word is a view in the positive light. You know, it's kind of a good thing, not a bad thing. But in the Christian context, it is a word that raises warning flags among God's people, or it should raise warning flags among God's people. I did look it up in a modern dictionary. It was very insightful. Listen to this definition in a modern dictionary. The generation gap. The lack of communication and understanding between young people and their parents brought about by differences of tastes, values, and outlook. The lack of communication and understanding between young people and their parents, it is brought about by differences in tastes, values, and their overall outlook of life. That's quite a definition, isn't it? Especially when you look at it in the Christian context. Probably every parent in this room trembles as they listen to that definition. Maybe some more than others. 
depending on where you fall on that a graph, a line graph of how much that communication and misunderstanding and that gap is in your own. But that's the modern dictionary's definition of the generation gap. In the Christian context, these differences break down communication. Different tastes, different values, different outlook. I see it different than you. That breaks down communications. I don't feel so free to communicate. Then that breakdown of communication brings misunderstanding. We don't understand each other. And as we don't understand each other, that makes the gap in our tastes and our values and our outlook get a little bit bigger. And with the gap getting a little bit bigger, that breaks down more communication and thus the cycle goes on and on And on. And if you want to travel down that cycle long enough, you'll find a church full of old people with no young people in it. Ever been in a church like that? Hmm? Let me see your hands. Have you been in a church like that? Wow! More hands than I expected to see. This gap is one of the most practical challenges of us first and even second generation Christians. And I studied a bit down through the church list as I was meditating upon this. And as near as I can figure, there's about two thirds of us in this room are are first generation Christians. Some may have had some Christian background, but I went down through there and looked at the ones who've been born again. Older in their lives. Two-thirds of us are first-generation Christians. And the second generation and the third generation is what my burden is for this morning. So for us first and second, Second generation Christians, this gap is a very practical challenge to us for the next generation. The danger of this gap requires much careful meditation on your part. Because I don't believe it's the heart of God at all. I can't find any room for it anywhere in the Scripture that there would be a gap, an ever-widening gap in the convictions of fathers and mothers and the convictions of the children and the children's children. I I can't see it. Moses recognized this danger, this generation gap. He recognized it all the way back in Deuteronomy in chapter 32 and verse 7. At the end of his life, he was admonishing and instructing The children of Israel, just before they went into the promised land and just before he passed off the scene. He's a wise old man, 120 years old now. And he has some powerful words to share with the children of Israel before he passes off the scene. And God inspires him to write a song. And instruct the children of Israel to sing this song. Over and over and over, in the midst of the song, he gives them this admonition in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 7. Remember the days of old and consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father and he will show thee thy elders and they will tell thee. I think that's a good admonition for us also this morning. Good days and pleasant circumstances and wonderful blessings have a tendency to bring complacency on the next generation and the ones following that 
Good days, brothers and sisters. Pleasant circumstances and overwhelming blessings have a tendency to breed complacency in the next generations. Moses knew that. And therefore, he warned them that they would have that tendency and gave them instructions. But in this psalm, we find these prophetic words of what happened, of the response of the children of Israel to the good days and the pleasant circumstances and all the blessings that were upon them. It says of Israel, Jeshuran waxed fat and kicked. Can anybody tell me what? That kick was? It was a kick against God and God's ways. That's what happens. Joshua also saw this problem and addressed it at the end of his life. If you want to turn over there, there's a few more verses we can read them together. In Joshua... Chapter 24, in the midst of those famous verses that all of us know very well and probably can quote, Joshua saw this same problem. He's 110 years old now and he's ready to pass off the scene. In Joshua chapter 24 and verse 14, hear his heart. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him. In sincerity and in truth, good counsel, Joshua, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Right response, at least in word, right response. Probably every one of us here in this room would say the same thing, wouldn't we? Let's drop down now to verse 20. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And I I want us to read these verses in the context of the fact that we know what they did. And don't get too tough on them. We're pretty bold with our words too. Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve Him. And they said, We are witnesses Now therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your ear unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and His voice we will obey. There are three generations that I'd like to look at here. If you just uh, give me a little... Opportunity to give you some insight into the scene here. There's three generations that are sitting uh, here in this scene. The first generation is Joshua. I'm not sure if there's anybody else alive. I studied a little bit, but I couldn't find it. I'm not sure if Caleb is dead at this point or if he's still alive. But if you remember, Joshua and Caleb were the two men who at about 40 years old were allowed to live while the rest of their generation died in the wilderness over a 40-year period. 
They finally entered into the land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb, both being 80 years old, 60 years old. But a whole generation of people die. Then there is another second generation here, and that is the generation of people who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. They saw God's works for 40 years. They saw the judgments of God for 40 years. They saw the provisions of God for 40 years. They are also here in this scene. And then there's another generation in this scene. And that's the generation that was born and grew up in the land of Canaan. Or the generation that was born in the wilderness, but maybe they were just ten years old when they entered into the land of Canaan. And they've come to adulthood now. They're thirty years old. They're forty years old. There's fathers. There's mothers. There's children. There's a whole thing there. These three generations. It's very interesting when you consider what happened to these people. And we will look at the words over in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7 to see the results of these people as they entered into the land of Canaan and found rest and good days, and blessings. In Judges chapter 2, verse 7, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua. Those are the ones who lived through the wilderness, who had seen the great works of the Lord that He did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Hersea, in the mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. Three generations here. Some time ago, coming back home a bit on this generation gap, this generational drift in the church, some years ago, I was in an airport in, I believe it was Memphis, Tennessee, you know, just sitting there waiting to get on a plane, and I noticed these people. I mean, everywhere I went, there were these people. They were a plain and a simple people. They were a conservative people. You could tell by the way they looked that they were a conservative people. You could tell by the spirit that was in them and on their faces that they were a conservative and a humble and a simple people. And... The men were modest, and the ladies were modest, and the women wore veilings, and and I thought, my, what is this? You know, I'm going to go find out who these people are. And I walked up to a few of them and started talking to them, a couple of the older men and their wives, and and they started sharing with me, I believe, if I remember right, it was, uh, they were Plymouth Brethren, which, um, if you've ever met Plymouth Brethren, many of them are a conservative people. But uh, they were Plymouth Brethren, and it was a whole plane full of people. They chartered a plane from New Zealand and came to the United States to one of their conferences. So I'm sitting there visiting with these older men and their wives, and while I'm visiting, you know, I'm observing. And I saw with my eyes three generations all there in the airport together. Three generations. There were the older men and women with a testimony, a plain and simple testimony, and a spirit of humility about them. Their testimony was clear, and it was without question. Then there was another group, which was the middle-aged group, which would have probably been the sons and daughters of these older ones. They were there also, and there was a bit of difference in them. There was a difference in their spirit. 
There was a difference in their attire. There was a difference in, in the, their appearance. The, the dresses were a little bit shorter. Uh, and all those things that go along with it, all those things were different. Then there was the next generation, which would have been the grandchildren of these old men and these old ladies that I was talking to. And they, they were the youth. There wasn't any little ones. These were youth, you know, 17, 18 years old. Shorter dresses, smaller coverings, tighter clothes, and a different spirit about them than what the fathers and the mothers had and what the children of the fathers and the mothers had. A different spirit about them. Well, I didn't forget that little visit that I saw there, but that's a good example of the burden of my heart this morning. I saw in that airport there, many years back now, a generation gap. And a generation gap gets very practical when it gets lived out of the hearts and into the lives of the people. You can see the generation gap. It's easy to spot. What are some of the danger signs of this generation gap? Let me just share a few of them with you this morning. Number one, a tendency to ignore what mom and dad think. A tendency to just kind of turn off mom and dad. <clears throat> you know... Mom and dad, you know, I mean, God bless mom and dad. You know, they're mom and dad and they've taken good care of us. But, you know, just kind of a tendency to, you know, slot them over there a bit. Off to the side in your mind. And by the way, this message is not just to the youth that are in this room. You know, some of us older ones can do the same thing. Number two, a tendency to ignore what the elders and the older brothers and sisters in the church think. You know, you just kind of slot them over here. Well, you know, the elders, the elders are the elders. And you know how elders are. And you know how they are. They kind of get, you know, they kind of go too far. And, you know, they're kind of strong. And they're they elders. We'll put them over there. And you know, the older brothers and sisters, well, you know, they're older and, you know, well, they're just older, you know. So we'll put them over there too. A tendency to ignore what the elders and the older brothers and sisters think. Number three, you begin to see, you know, you see them, you watch them, you hear them. You know, you can't get away from them because God put all of us together. He did that by design, by the way. So you can't get away from them. You see them, you watch them, you hear them, but you just kind of slot them, you know, old-fashioned. You know? Well, they're just kind of old-fashioned, you know. <clears throat> or maybe you have thoughts like this. This is a good one for Lancaster County. <clears throat> In your mind, you swap them as being traditional. They're just kind of traditional, you know, and... You know, we're against tradition. Praise God, praise God. Oh, we're against tradition and they're kind of traditional. So we'll leave them over there in their traditional slot and we'll find our own way. Number five, you catch your thoughts thinking like this. They just don't understand. Our day and our age. Mom, Dad, the elders, the older ones in the 
congregation, they just don't understand our day and our age. And, you know, this thing goes, you know, you may not say it out loud, but it's there, you know. It's there. You know, it's, you know, we're right. We think we're more right. And we're seeing it more clearly. And, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put up with these elders over here. And, you know, you know, but we see more clearly. These are some of the danger signs I'm giving. See? I think we know better. And someday, I'll get a chance to show that I do know better. And lastly, this generation gap, you can spot it with this tendency. You tend to make decisions based on what your peers think, rather than what the older ones think. You tend to make your decisions based on what your peers think. And you converse about your decisions with your peers. In First Kings, First Kings chapter twelve, I want to read verse one through ten. It's a very sobering account. of this generation gap. See, it's not a modern thing. We just have a modern name for it. And I chose the modern name so we can relate to the people who live in this world we live in. But it's not a modern thing, this generation gap. In 1 Kings chapter 12, Solomon has died... And now his son, Rehoboam, has taken the place of king over Israel. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass, when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon, and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt." that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make thou the grievous service of thy father and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart ye, yet, depart yet for three days, Then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him and which stood before him now. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. 
And that's far enough for us to read here this morning. We get the, we can see what has happened here. We all know the history, the devastating results of what took place here. And we can see here, this is a classic example of this generation gap and the destruction that can come from it. Rehoboam submitted himself to peer pressure. The boys that he grew up with. His friends, his buddies, all through those years growing up, he submitted himself to what they thought and refused the counsel of the wise old men who sat in the court with Solomon, his father. I want us to note here that this plague had already broken out before the time to make a choice. It wasn't just all of a sudden there. But Rehoboam knew. He knew already. He already had it set in his mind. Yes, he went and asked the old men, but he already had it set in his mind where he was going to go, what he was going to do. He was already in his mind, the old men What do they know? It was also already in the minds of his peers, the old men. What do they know? So he did what so many do. He went to those who would tell him what he wanted to hear. And thus, they all made their decision and charted the course of the testimony of God's kingdom upon the earth. Wow! What an awesome thing they did that day. So flippantly, they made their choices. Thus, the road of reasoning that leads downward was there. Other kings and people reasoned the same way. High places, you can have high places and still serve Jehovah. You can have groves and worship God in creation. It doesn't hurt to put up an image. We can still believe in Jehovah while we put up an image. Imagine their reasonings this morning. Oh, how they must have thought their way through these things one reasoning step at a time. Times have changed. We have quite a population growth, you know. The temple's crowded. Certain times of the year, the people are busy. It's hard for them to travel and get to Jerusalem. Let's make a grove. One over here. One over there. We can offer sacrifices in other places around the kingdom. Green groves are beautiful places to worship God. We'll put an altar there. And we can also offer sacrifices. And thus, they reasoned and they reasoned. And oh, it sounded so good. All their reasonings sounded so good, and little by little by little, the gap got wider and wider. Each generation thus reasons and waters down what previous generations had. And that, dear brothers and sisters, is the thing that we do not want. We do not want the next generation to water down the things which we have. We do not want to water down the things which we got from our parents that is right and holy and good and just. We do not want to lose those things. But thus, their reasonings. And I know... There comes a time when things are dead and departed, when it is right to start all over. But may I encourage you this morning, you are not in that place where everything is dead and there's no spirituality. You are not in that place. Twice in the book of Judges, it gives this testimony of this third generation that we looked at there in Joshua. It gives this testimony of that third generation. 
after the elders who outlived Joshua passed away, then, this is what it says, the people, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. He reasoned and reasoned and reasoned. And little by little, they departed further and further and further. We don't want to do that, do we? I know we don't want to do that. I know you don't want to do that. I know you young people don't want to do that. I know you don't want that for your little children. Young married couples that are here. I know that. I know if we were to go around and ask each one of you in a personal interview, you'd give us words just like they gave to Joshua. Bold words. Strong words. Words of determination and commitment. You'd give them. I know that. Can't you hear them reasoning? I don't think I'll sacrifice this time. What do you think? Well, the fathers were pretty strict, you know, in all their demands. And, you know, Moses was really a fanatical kind of a guy. And, yeah, you're right. And, and you know, besides that, it, it, it's the heart that matters. And I still love God and all this outward stuff. And I just think I, I'll skip the sacrifices this year. Yeah, I think I will too. I think you're right. Yeah. And thus they consoled each other as they slowly moved further and further away from all the beautiful things that God gave them. Wow. <clears throat> I wonder, are we falling into this trap? This pit of human reasonings? Hmm? Are your elder brothers and sisters helping you make decisions? Or is that only your peers that hear the choices you're looking at, the decisions you need to make? Who's helping you make your decisions? Oh, the danger of being young. And now I'm on my own. And now I'm big. And now I can make my own decisions. Let's see. What will I do? Who's helping you make your decisions? Is it only your peers? Oh, you talk to your peers. No problem there. But who's helping you make your decisions? You know, the everyday ones that we make. How is it in your own heart? You know, is it like this? I know what Dad thinks. I know what the elders think. I don't need to go ask them. But they just don't understand. Danger, my friend, if you know what your elders think, if you know what their heart is, if you know what their vision is and their burden is, and you don't even go to ask them that you're making your own choices in light, in light of that and going a different way, you are in a dangerous place. God has placed protective principles in the Bible to eliminate, to limit this generation gap that we're speaking about this morning. Here are the words of First Peter. Beautiful words as I meditated upon them. Fresh and new. Beautiful words. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. There's no gap in these words. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. And that 
word elder there is not meaning elders. But it's just meaning the older ones. Us gray hairs. You know, the ones that aren't walking quite as fast anymore. We're not running like we used to run. Listen to them. Peter says, Ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Humble yourselves therefore unto the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. And I want you to see the context of those two verses. They're connected together. See, you might think, hmm, submit to the elders, submit to the older ones, yield my heart to how they see and how they feel about the church and the vision of the church and all. Yeah, that's called humility, young man. Dear sister, that's called humility. Oh, but you say, I know better. Yeah, well, you may. You may. But let's give it some time. Don't jump too fast. Titus is another place. If you can just turn there, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. No, no generation gap in these verses. None. Chapter 2, verse 2. That the aged men, there's the old men, <clears throat> be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, sound in charity, sound in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers, of good things. Who are they going to teach? That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Why? That the Word of God be not blasphemed. Tell the young men likewise Exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, in gravity and sincerity. Let him be sound in speech, speech that cannot be condemned. Why? That he that is of a contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say unto you, young man. No evil thing. When I look at those verses in light of the subject that we're looking at here this morning, I see God so wisely blending all of these together. Old men, old women, with young men, young women. Those young men and young women get married. They pass on what they got from the old men and the old women to their children. And one generation after the next generation after the next generation just keeps on going for God. God has put us together. He is no dummy, may I say that, without being sacrilegious this morning. He knows what He's doing when He put us all together in a church. Blessed is that church that has men and women with gray hair that are full of the fire of God and love the Word of God with all their hearts. Blessed is that place. And blessed are the young people and the young married couples who are in such a place as that. You are sitting in a gold mine. And then the last one, and there are others, but this is enough to get the point here. Honor your father and your mother, <clears throat> the Scriptures say. Now, I don't believe if you're here today and you're married, God has blessed you and given you a husband or given you a wife, that you have to do everything your father says, everything your mother says. No, 
God has established a new authority and all those things are in their place. But you are not exempt from honoring your father and your mother. Say, well, what does it mean to honor your father and your mother? It means you look up to them. You are concerned about what they think. You know, there are men in my life that I honor and respect. I want to know what they think. I go ask them. Even when I know already what they think, and it's different than what I think, I still go ask them. It's that way when you honor It means to look up to. It means to esteem. Weigh their counsel very heavily. How do we eliminate this generation gap? Let's go back to the Bible. The Bible principles are real clear. Let's go back to our parents. God has placed them in front of us as guides and counselors and teachers. Let's go back to the parents. It's our responsibility to guide our own children, our young people. It's our responsibility to provide an example and give them direction. And let's go back to our elders. God has placed them in our midst as an example and a voice to guide our lives. You know, think about that a minute. You you think about your elders and you think, yeah, well, you know, they're kind of... Oh, really? Paul said in the book of Hebrews, whose faith follow? We think that's just some theoretical floating faith up here. (laughs) Whose faith follow? We have many good examples to follow. If we are all endeavoring to follow the Bible principles and not traditions, and I'm not plugging traditions here this morning, I'm for Bible principles, but we're very foolish if we claim to believe in Bible principles and just keep slowly sliding further and further and further away from clear expressions of Bible principles. I'm for Bible principles. I personally believe if that gap is there, it's it's there because our teaching is weak. Whether it be father and mother's teaching or whether it be us elders' teaching, our teaching is weak. And therefore, the principle is not being grasped. If we go the way of Bible principles then there should not be a large gap or a big difference in our expressions of the Christian faith. I don't think there should be a gap. I don't think it should be different. What's wrong with mom's dress? What's wrong with her covering? Is she old-fashioned? 
Is that how you look at it? <coughs> Clothes, coverings, cars, radios, you know? I'm just guessing, but I'm a pretty good guesser after 25 years of being a pastor. But my guess is there are many, many young people in this room and young marrieds who listen to that radio all the time, you know. <coughs> when mom and dad never touched it. Now, come, let us reason together. Are you more spiritual? Are you stronger? Can you handle it? Or did mom and dad just look at something that was harmless and say that's a dangerous thing? How do you look at that in your mind? See? Clothes, coverings, cars, radios, videos, music, what we buy, amusements. Well, the list can go on and on and on. You know, well, you know, Mom, you know, Dad, he just, mm -hmm, Sunday afternoon. Well, you know, Dad, he just, you know, he was like this and, you know... And, Miniature golf, you know, we he just didn't allow those things. But you know, he, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and here we go. One step at a time. Further, further, further away. And my encouragement is that us fathers and mothers, we need to help our young people in these things. We need to guide them. We need to talk. We need to communicate. You say, we can't communicate. Danger! Danger! That's the gap we're talking about. It's the sign that the gap is there. We can't communicate. And by the way, if we're ever going to eliminate that gap, there's going to have to be a willingness to communicate on both sides. Got to do that. We must help our young people in these things. And young people, you need to yield to the guiding counsel of the older brothers and sisters in this fellowship. You need to yield. You don't know as much as you think you do. Parents, we need to guide them. Youth, we need to be guidable. How is it with you? <clears throat> Why does your covering get thinner and more transparent and smaller and further back? You know, why is that? Are, are we missing something? What is wrong with mom's dress? Why must it be tighter? Brighter? The shortest sleeves you can get with all the fancy extras on it. What's wrong with mom's dress? Has she lost her way and you have all a tremendous spiritual insight that mom doesn't have? Do you really think that's the truth? What's wrong with mom and dad's simple shoes? You know? What's wrong with their shoes? Why must yours be so stylish? Higher heels, pointed toes, 
And on and on the list shall go. You know, cowboy boots and, you know, big tennis shoes with tongues hanging out over them. And, you know, what's wrong with dad's shoes? I saw a picture years ago. It was my first viewing. I've seen many since then. A family picture. A generational family picture. Have you ever seen one of those? Where you look at it. it. Takes you a little bit to take it in, you know, because there's about 50 or 60 people in the picture. Finally, your eyes zero in and there's this old man and this old woman sitting there in the center. So sweet. So simple. So modest. Then you move out from there and you see the sons and the daughters. And then you move out from there and you see all the grandchildren. And when you look at it a little bit, you realize, whoa, something is changing here. It's called the generation gap. The generational drift in the church. Do we want that? Do we want that? We are getting some. Do we want it? Young people, do you want it? And I'm not just talking about the clothes that I saw in those pictures. No. That's just one little issue. We're talking about a heart attitude. See, the heart attitude is all those other things that we talked about a little earlier. And those kind of attitudes, yeah, well, you know, you know, Dad, and you know. Those attitudes are the things that, that they're the root attitudes that grow all these other fruits that you see all the way around you. Think about it, young people. Allow me, like Paul, for a moment to be foolish in the flesh. You'll understand me. Wouldn't you be disappointed if I showed up for church here next Sunday morning on a Suzuki motorcycle with my shades on and walked in here with my tight blue jeans and a tight short sleeve polo shirt? You know, and big white tennis shoes with the tongues hanging out over them. And about a one-eighth inch sign beard on my chin. Wouldn't you be disappointed in me? If I stepped up here next Sunday morning, that way, to preach to you the Word of God. I think most of you would be disappointed in me if I did that. You say, well, that's just not proper for the preacher to get up and do that. Oh, really? You mean there's a difference between the sacred and the secular for the Christian? There is not. There is not. See, what's wrong with Dad's shirt? Boys, what's wrong with dad's shirt? Why does it have to be a t-shirt, huh? You know, get them old muscles out there, walking around, picking up those things. Cover those muscles up, boy. Those are for your wife. What's wrong with dad's shirt? I realize that I could be very misunderstood this morning. I realize that. Let me give you some positive encouragement in closing. 
We want you to pass us up. We do. That's the longing of every father and every mother's heart in this room. We want you to pass us up. We want you to be more spiritual than we are. We want your fervor to be more fiery than ours is. We want your testimony to be clearer than ours is. We want you to go further in every Bible principle than we do. We want you to wax strong in the Lord. We want you to raise up a generation way beyond what we are or what we raise. That's what we want for you. Go for that. That'll take care of the generation gap. Because you know what? If you take off like that and you live like that, guess what? We will be running to catch up with you. We will. But this other gap, oh, we cannot. Away with it. We cannot go that way. Young people, let no man, no woman, despise thy youth. I looked up that word despise. You know, we, when we think of despise, we think of somebody looking down with scorn. That's not what that word means. It means, let no man count thy youth as naught. For nothing. Oh, they're nothing. Don't let it ever be said of you. They're nothing. Parents, in closing here, parents, we owe our children a vibrant life that we can pass on to them. Principal teaching day by day in our homes with applications and oversight to those applications. And number three, we owe them an example. We owe them that. Children, young people, follow your examples. Seek a vibrant life and follow your examples. The other does not come out right. I promise you. It does not come out right. (laughs) My encouragement in closing is this. A good long family talk about this subject. That's my encouragement. A good long Heart to heart, broken hearted, open family talk about this subject. And mom, dad, I'm giving you the platform. I just encourage you to lead out in it, in conversation, and open up the lines of communication again. In Jesus' name, let's pray. No fun, Lord. No fun. But oh, I thank you, Father, for allowing me to share my heart this morning. Not pleasant, Father. But I thank you for helping me. God, I just commit this message to you, Lord, and pray that you will fill in the gaps, God, of my feeble attempt to give a little direction here, God. Fill in the gaps, God. I pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Denny, for sharing your heart with us. Very much needed 
practical lesson for all of us. I find myself very needy this morning to look at my own life, family, the needs in my heart, my home. But I want to say that uh, I believe what we heard this morning is right. I believe it is good. And I believe that we, should, we need to take it to heart We need to face it. We need to look at it. And so I thank God for the message. I guess looking back over the years of being here, these are the kind of messages that I... I know that they're good for us and I know that they help us as families with our children. I know they do that. These directional kind of messages like this, they help us as fathers and they help us as mothers. Because, you know, we just, we need to be encouraged and strengthened in our inner man in these areas. So I want to open up here for some thoughts or confessions as, as the Lord leads you this morning. Oh, for a testimony of godliness in every generation. In the back? Yeah, I wanted to uh, bless Brother Denny. I can say that I feel like I didn't misunderstand him. I heard his heart. I that I caught his, his burden there. And I wanted to bless him for that and bless each one of our ministry here. Aaron, Emmanuel, Denny. I uh, just want to publicly acknowledge you and place myself underneath you and I see the importance of being under your authority and I do I do honor you I do respect you each one of you has many valuable truths and lessons for me to learn in my own life I just thank you Denny thank you brother how I appreciate hearing that from a young man I too want to bless Brother Denny this morning for his very clear message, a message that I believe was directly from God through his heart. As well, I want to bless the ministry and thank them for being uh, wise counselors. It was about this time, a year ago, that our family was at a crossroads and we were pursuing a I was pursuing a business opportunity, but not being a businessman or trained in that area, I felt strongly impressed to the Lord to seek wise counsel from my elders. And yet there was some trepidation with that being a new uh, family at this church. I found myself in the midst of a situation and felt some guilt for asking the elders while I was already in the situation. But God humbled me and I I asked the elders and the ministry to come and I was amazed at the wisdom, but I think I was even more amazed at the love. In the midst of their busy schedule, these men gave the better part of the day to counsel me in a decision that I am still reaping the blessings of. And I I would not have been able to make such a clear decision without that counsel. I was not equipped. And I just bless God for men in my life who are not only ministers, but wise in business. They are faithful with unrighteous mammon. 
and I want to thank you publicly, brothers, for your counsel at a crucial time in my life. The denominational background I come from is seeing some difficult days right now. Their pioneer, their founding father, had a vision for hippies. And as those men were saved, he discipled them, I suppose, from the pulpit, but never really had the time for them. As a result, those men grew up and formed churches that have outdone this original founder. Many of these churches are six, seven, eight, ten thousand members. This founding leader now, he is recovering from his son getting divorced and remarried. And many of the second generation now, their children are divorcing and remarrying. And a curious thing, the third generation, I guess a little bit younger than me, they are pierced and, and immodest and, and they're outward. It's almost like they're not the hippies that their father was, but they're sort of different. And the one thing I see missing in all of this that I've come from, that I left behind. I was there for almost 12 years serving in that denomination. The one thing I see missing that I think defines the generation gap is time. It seems that these men were ambitious and they didn't give their families time. I ended my affiliation with that denomination because I saw that to continue and to succeed in it, I was falling into the same trap. I was denying my family time. In love. Well, I've had a lot of time with my family for this one year now. But it's time that I wouldn't have had and I wouldn't have enjoyed and made the most of had my elders not stepped in at a very crucial time. So, Emmanuel, Brother Danny, Brother Aaron, Brother Malin, you men who've been involved in speaking into my life for this last year, I can't thank you enough for giving me time and advice and love at a very crucial time. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for sharing. It's a, it's a joy to see what God is doing in your heart and life. It's part of our rewards. Yes, I don't have a lot to say. I don't feel like I can add much to the message. I just want to say amen and just felt like it was right to say that I want to cast in my lot with the vision that was lifted up. This subject was one that nearly stumbled me when I came to the Lord because the people that I was associated with at that time would point out this generational gap and generational drift and I looked and it was true they were unconverted but yet they could see that and it nearly it really caused me to search and if it wouldn't have been for what God had done in my own heart and the vision that he somehow through his word laid on my own heart that it doesn't need to be that way I don't know where I would be today but I just want to follow after that vision that God put on my heart by His grace and encourage others to go the same way. God bless you, brother. Amen. In the back over here. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, share just a little word of testimony. I I don't uh, at all mean to counteract anything at all. But I just like to say that for myself, as a young man, I, I, it's not like I don't appreciate any reproof or any instruction. I have very much uh, appreciated it from those that came from. And just being here as a church, it's, I've learned a lot and grown it in that in many ways. But the one thing that, that breaks me and sobers me more than anything is when somebody comes up to me and encourages me. And uh, just blesses me. And 
And as I look in the scripture there, before Solomon became king, David just poured, poured blessings all over him, prayed blessings and everything. And then Rehoboam comes in the picture, and it seems like Solomon just he was taken away with all his stuff. I guess I don't know what you know. He had all his wives and you know everything else, and he just maybe didn't even have time to see Rehoboam hardly, you know. And Rehoboam just stuck with whoever he spent time with. And so I just you know I just give it out as you know from my perspective a little bit, and and uh, I'm very thankful for each one here. Thank you for sharing with us, brother. Thank you, brother Denny, for being faithful to the Lord. Thank you for preaching that message this morning. And I have to confess I stand in need. I see areas where I have failed. But I do desire to to press in, to go on. One of the things you mentioned was that this... Uh, danger of this generation gap requires meditation giving thought to it to pray to examine our hearts and I encourage us to do that another encouragement you gave us brother Denny was to have a good long family talk and I just want to encourage us as dads you know to to do that to take courage and to do that I had to think of what Brother Kenny shared this morning of the testimony of Klaus. When he heard the Godly Home tapes, he, he got a hold of it with zeal. But there was a distance between him and his children because it was in rigidity and there was a lack of love. And I sense this could happen maybe in this type of a message, but I thank God for the message. And I just want to encourage us that we don't do that. We don't approach it in a law or a rigidity without a broken heart and love. And so I encourage us, let us exhort one another and let us encourage our youth to pass us up. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Aaron. <clears throat> I have one up front here. I just also as a young person want to stand and bless Brother Denny for that message and say Amen and I embrace that. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I believe there's many more of you younger sisters who could say that's your heart. I know that. Also, would like to say this morning that I share that burden. I've had a lot of time to think and meditate in the last week, just the way God directed my schedule and everything. And traveling back on the plane from Holland, my mind was going back to our forefathers, my forefathers, that they came across those same waters, and looking at how that when they came to America. They just kind of laid down, laid back because of all the persecution, because of all the struggles. And they fell asleep because of materialism and having a good farm. And they took their eyes off Christ and his kingdom, began to focus on differences of opinions on practical things. And we see the splinters of those groups today yet. Families being divided. I just make a plea with all of us here today that the answer to this generation gap is to let God and His kingdom and the purposes of Jesus Christ to consume our hearts and to make that our focus and goal. And allow Him to turn our hearts to the purpose and the reason why God has us here. And I also would like to make a confession here this morning that I have sat on this bench in times past and remained silent. I'm sorry for that. 
And I want to say this morning that this church, you and I are going to weep and wail and wring our hands over this subject this morning. The question is, are we going to do it now when there's hope? Or will we do it in 12 years from now when the larger percentage of the young families will be leaving this church? Do we have another one here? Okay. I just want to say amen, Brother Denny. Thank you for that. I, I believe that's beating upon the heart of God for us as a church. And young people, we need this. We desperately need this, young people. We're sitting in the place of Rehoboam. And it's about to be handed over to us. We've got to have a vision. We've got to see straight. And we've got to pick up the things that they've handed to us and run. And we're sitting in the place of Rehoboam. And it is up to us. What are we going to do? In this next generation. Oh, may God take us on. Thank you, brother. Okay, down here. I'd like to say thank you too, Brother Denny, for sharing this morning. I'm not sure how to say what all I throw my heart, but um, I think all of us have seen the generational drift around us. We've seen those who've come to this country because of persecution or whatever, just as was shared. And people with a zeal for the Lord, a desire to serve the Lord, and to have godly families. And then we see it go on three, four generations, and there's divorce and remarriage and you name it. And uh, I think it's just that the, the vision's lost. And uh, so it's my desire to pass that vision on to my family and to encourage them in the ways of the Lord. Yes, thank you, Brother Denny, for that message. I really appreciate it. And I just want to bless you elders for, for watching over me and watching over us as a church. Don't slow down. Keep on doing what you are doing. <clears throat> Another thing I would like to share is, I know I could be misunderstood, but something, a spirit that I sometimes sense, and I fear that spirit. <clears throat> it's spirit of, well, you know, driving a plain car don't make any more spiritual or fasting, well, I don't really make any more spiritual. I'd like to ask you, does it make you any less spiritual? And there's, <clears throat> I see that spirit, I, I sense that spirit here sometimes from people. This or that don't make, make you any more spiritual. It don't make you any less spiritual either. Thank you, brother. We read these verses this morning earlier. It says, Hold fast the form of sound words, which ye have heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This is the form of sound words this morning. And I do one prayer too. My children are getting older and I went to learn how to get in their hearts as young as uh, people instead of as children and I need prayer in that area I just wanted to share this morning is just I was thankful for the message that Denny shared this morning and was blessed by it and uh I really appreciate the wisdom that was shared and all that just in the generation gap. And my heart as a young person is to follow the teachings that have been taught to us as young people by our parents and by those who understand the things of life and how it can lead us astray. And in all sincerity of heart, you know, there's times where I felt like 
They just didn't understand me. And one thing that our brother did say, or one of our brothers said earlier, was just the fact that sometimes just just love, just encouragement, just a positive um, approach or, or encouragement given to us young people does really help as we sort through the issues in our lives and learn to, to follow that which has been taught. But I also, as I thought of uh, the eunuch that was traveling and, and uh, how Philip came up behind him and he said, how can I unless someone show me? You know, in other words, how could he understand? And I think somewhat the same way with us young people. How can we understand unless somebody show us and at the same time, just that encouragement. We do want to, to understand what, what you're trying to teach us and we just pray that you would have the, the grace with us to, to allow you to lead us and direct us and guide us and whatever. And I wish the Lord's blessing on you elders as you endeavor to help us young people. But I did find three verses in Proverbs that were an encouragement. And that was that in uh, Proverbs 17, verse 27, he says, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. And then in chapter 19, verses 20 and 21, he says, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in the latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. And then in chapter 20, verse 5, it says, Counsel in the heart of old men is like deep water. It did say men, but I put old men there. It's like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. And I think that's true. Our, the elders that have gone on before us and the fathers that are a lot older have pioneered the way. And for us young people to to challenge that is quite foolish according to scripture because we haven't experienced all that life has yet to bring and we would do well to heed to the instruction thank you to you fathers and your elders for your wisdom may god bless you amen over here about seven years ago before we moved here, we're still in California. Jennifer and I came out for Bible school, and I had a talk with Denny. He had already been out to stay with us in California about four days. And he said, don't forget where you've come from. Being alone, you have an edge a little bit, because that's all you have. But we forgot. When you come here, you can be lazy. You can let down your guard. And then the gap gets bigger and bigger. I was one of those girls who didn't listen to her father. And I got into a lot of trouble. And now it's my turn. As being one of the moms. Don't forget. God bless you, sister. Thank you for sharing. When uh, <clears throat> Brother Denny was reading in uh, Deuteronomy 32.7 about remember the days of old, consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee, thy elders, and they will tell thee. I have been, my personal study has been in Jeremiah. Uh, and I, I've been absolutely marveling how it fits today's lifestyle or the or environment that we're, that's around us. And in Jeremiah verses, chapter 6, it's in verse 13 it says, For from the least of them, even unto the greatest, every one of them is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. And it goes on, it says in verse 15, they were ashamed when they had committed abomination, nay, they were not all ashamed, neither would they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I visit them. They shall be cast down, saith the Lord. And in verse 16, I've been meditating on this a lot. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. 
and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. The old paths, I took that word old, I thought I knew what it meant, but it means the everlasting, eternal paths. Let us not say, we will not walk therein. Let us heed the counsel that we're hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Those words in the back. I just want to say thank you, Brother Denny, for the message this morning. All you elders, for uh, the time you spend preparing messages and sharing your burden with us as a church. And I just want to be honest that sometimes, at times I struggle with these issues in my life and heeding counsel, but there have been many times where God has... Where I've tasted and God has shown me many blessings of heeding to my parents' counsel, and that's my heart to just go on with God and follow the counsel of the older men. Thank you. Sister said, go ahead. I was very thankful for the message this morning. It's a subject I'm definitely on my heart, and I my grandpa passed away this summer. And we get a we pass around a, a, a circle letter, and he loved the Lord. Um, the, it would be a circle letter from all of some of his brothers and sisters and their children, and his children and his grandchildren. And we've looked at these generations of of his generations, and ask why was not his plain faith passed on his plain life his love for Jesus has been in large part passed on but two of the areas that we have looked at are the leadership the male leadership he he was not a leader able to pass along the vision of what the principles he stood for meant and why we should keep them. So his children still love the Lord and serve the Lord. His grandchildren then, there was a departing, even one of his children, there was some departing. And the other part was the, the lack of leadership again among the, the men standing up and giving the vision to their families. We could look how that was passed on and see a, a need and how, how desperately we need the men to stand up and lead in our homes. And, and also the, from the children's side, side, what a blessing it was in my life. And some of my cousins, those that we honored our parents, came to them for counsel, heard their hearts and sought it, the honor gives a blessing that is uncountable in our lives and that just the testimony that to, to go to your elders and ask find out what's on their heart even if they're not good at communicating we can be initiating the communication why did we do this why does the Bible say this why don't we do this and I think those are keys and I, I praise the Lord for the message Thank you for that picture. Recently I was reading in first and second Kings and the kings of Israel their standard that they were that the that is written about them is Jeroboam the son of Nebat which made Israel to sin. And that's mentioned many, many times about the kings of Israel after the kingdom was divided. And the standard in the kingdom of Judah was that he either he served God as did David his father or he did not serve God as did his David his father. Very interesting. And so... Each leader that rises up and comes out in the forefront 
each leader is casting his shadow. And what a sister Laura said about her grandfather who died, that man cast his shadow. And that shadow overshadows his posterity, his children and children's children. And it affects them. And every one of us as fathers, it's like we're stepping up on the stage where there's a light shining and now we're, we're casting our shadow of life out of our children. Every one of us is casting a shadow. And so, it is very...